It's a gruesome anniversary that the world marks today, six years of civil war in Syria. Millions displaced, families torn apart, more than 400,000 dead. Tonight, we bring you on-the-ground reports from the Middle East. I'm Lorna Duick. And I'm Sheldon Neal. And you're watching Context. Syrian refugees are victims of a conflict they have no part in. Devastation continues in the ancient land of Syria. Since the beginning of time, people have called this place home. Tonight they step off the plane as refugees, uh, but they walk out of this terminal as permanent residents of Canada. Canada welcoming in new neighbours. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau personally greeting the first round of Syrian refugees while we look at solutions Canada has brought for thousands in crisis. And... I'm Molly Thomas in southern Turkey. Six years on and Syrians are still suffering. We're bringing you stories from the largest refugee hosting country in the world. We want to hear from you tonight. We're streaming live on YouTube and on a special way on Facebook. Sheldon Neal has more. That is right, Lorna. On Facebook, I'll be hosting a live stream from studio. Check us out behind the scenes during the live show. Thanks, Sheldon. And here are the news stories that caught our attention this week. March 15, 2011. On this day six years ago, peaceful protests rang out in the streets of Syria. As protesters rallied it for freedom and change, government troops opened fire. That was the spark that turned this conflict into the largest refugee and displacement crisis of our time. More than 400,000 lives lost, nearly 5 million refugees, and more than 8 million internally displaced. Six years later, Syria is still under siege. Canada's court system is in disarray in processing trials and some justices are calling it a nightmare. People accused of deadly crimes are being released due to delays. Now the Supreme Court has set a deadline to get it fixed. It means provinces are doing triage on which cases get dismissed without a trial. We'll have a special report on what that means for justice in Canada coming soon on Context. The United Nations is making an urgent humanitarian call. People in four different countries are facing starvation and famine. South Sudan, Yemen, Somalia and Northeast Nigeria are all in need of food. The UN says hundreds of thousands of children are severely malnourished and international aid is urgently needed. Context is bringing you on the ground reports from Somalia in April and check out World Vision's Raw Hope page on how you can help now. And those are just some of the stories that caught our eye. Now to our focus this week. Syria, six years in, and here's more of our special coverage from Turkey. We are in Rehanli, really just five kilometers from that Syrian-Turkish border. So right on this side, you can see behind me the Syrian mountains. On the other side, the Turkish mountains. And there's actually a fence-like wall that you can see that divides the two areas. And of course, it's too dangerous for us to go over to Syria right now. But uh, thanks to technology, we're able to connect with people right over that border. Steps away, Syrians are scrambling for safety. Uh, 700,000. 700,000 yeah. people that have moved uh, IDBs from Hama, from, from, Hama Idlib. from Idlib, from Aleppo, from wow. all of the area to the Turkish border. Okay. It's an informal this safe zone from airstrikes. Because if you cross into oh, Turkish uh, airspace, well, you're in trouble. <laughs> this mom fled from western Aleppo. Her five kids are in an IDP camp. So, and then the cams they're using that's uh, kind of heating for schooling, uh, using coal. Coal heating? Yeah, coal heating. So okay. it's like very smoky. Okay. So it's like not good for a child. Eight million are on the run within Syria. Some flee to the border simply because of good medical care. This pediatric and maternity hospital operates because of Canadian dollars. But even incubators with tiny babies cannot keep up with demand. Are there kids waiting? To, like, how does that waiting. work? Like, sometimes, sometimes, I, I remember one of the times that uh, it's been like three hospitals have been targeted in that area. So three maternity and children hospitals have been targeted in like f in one week. 
So all of the children in that area have been referred to our hospital. We started in 2013 uh, with a, just a basic facility and then we expanded. And now we reached the point where we can't expand any anymore. Now with World Vision, uh, we, they secured funding for us to build a brand new hospital. So we almost tripling the size of the existing facility. That means more surgeries for children like Mohammed. I was playing outside with the kids. I was going back to the tent when I heard the jet. I remember seeing tents burning, then I can't remember anything. When he woke up, Mohammed learned that he had lost his left leg. Still, that's not the worst part of the story. My mom came in crying. She waited a month to tell me my two sisters and brother were killed in that attack. Every child in Syria has a story. Six years in, a new report says some are choosing suicide. Young Mohammed, who lost his leg in that story, told Molly, I'm not the worst case. There are a lot of other children that have cases worse than mine. Maurice Labelle, an assistant professor in history from the University of Saskatchewan. Maurice, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, uh, Maurice, why has this raged on for so long? At the core of it, there are three main reasons. First and foremost, the Assad regime has, does, refuses to lose the war, meaning that it wants total victory. And as a result of this, it's purposely in, used violent tactics and targeted military operations to, in, uh, uh, to incite divisions and further, further um, extend the conflict, if you will. Secondly, unfortunately, as a result of some of uh, Assad's targeted campaigns against particular communities, uh, the Syrian opposition itself is in shambles. S Opposis, opposing Syrians of the Assad regime simply just can't agree on what a post-Assad Syria looks like. Or even that, really, more recently, the conversation has even been scaled back a bit to, to, to incorporate the option of even leaving Assad in power. What would a post-civil war Assad-led Syria look like? Can we blame this war on religion? No, absolutely not. This is not a religious war. We, in order to understand the foundations of this war, we have to go back to its its beginnings. And the beginning, the, the, the key issue with this war is human dignity. Just like the broader um, uprisings or the so-called Arab Spring, if you will. Um, general popular opposition against Assad's authoritarianism started this war. Religion was used as a tool by Assad targeted violence against religious communities was used as a tool by the Assad regime to essentially perpetuate the war. Uh, how much of this is simply a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia in terms of solving anything? This war started in Syria with Syrians. That is the key to understanding this war. I, Russia has a huge role to play in supporting the Assad regime and extending this war for six years plus now, tragically. But um, this is not a new kind of Cold War war or a post-Cold War Cold War war. Uh, this is a Syrian war. Local actors are using their broad international networks to perpetuate the war. Uh, Maurice, thank you so much for your time with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sheldon. That was Maurice Labelle, an expert on the Middle East from the University of Saskatchewan. Okay, well, within a prolonged crisis like Syria, the needs are constantly changing. How do staff on the ground adapt? Our Molly Thomas now with that angle. In 2017, I mean, are the greatest needs inside or outside of Syria? It's hard to compare misery. Frankly, all over the response in every country, you'll find people who are absolutely suffering and have suffered for six years. Inside of Syria, of course, you're exposed to the continued conflict. So even maybe your situation in terms of income, in terms of the safety of your family, the situation of your children might be better. You're still being inflicted with this bombardment on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day. And that has to be, you have to see that as worse. I mean, what are the unique challenges of working, I mean, within those borders? 
Access. So access to the people who need our help the most. Even though we are able now to work across a fairly broad area in northern Syria um, and we're accessing communities in southern Syria as well, there are still huge parts of Syria where we can't get access to all these besieged communities that we think at least 400,000 people are living in. More than half of them are children. Uh, Canadian taxpayers, I mean many of them are, are investing in Syria, they may not even know it. Um, give them an idea of where their money is going on the ground. A lot of the time, the work we're doing is what we call pure humanitarian relief. You're handing things out like mattresses, blankets, kits, shelter. And you, you really, when you're doing this kind of work, it's honestly keeping people's heads above water. I mean, the infrastructure in a lot of the places that we work in um, Syria has completely collapsed. You can't go down the street and go and see your doctor. You can't go to the shops and buy whatever you need. And so being able to be reliably provide those services, which the Canadian government has actually helped us to do in many areas, is, is absolutely incredible and such a positive change for these communities. Children are often the most fragile victims of war. I mean, what do you see in terms of, of what they need on the ground there? These kids have been there for six years. They've seen horrible things. When we've spoken to children and they describe seeing people's heads blown off like it's watching a video game, and this is their mum or their dad that they're talking about, these children have seen things that no child should have to, and they, they are suffering for it. We've seen a lot of um, need for psychological support. At this point, Chris, are you, are you hopeful? Uh, that, that this is going to be resolved. We have to remain hopeful and positive that that can happen because the minute we give up, the minute we stop advocating for that, um, we've given up on people uh, and that's just not acceptable. And Molly, we don't want to give up on them either. Thank you for going right to the front lines there of the refugee crisis in the Syrian war. What is World Vision doing then to help? You know, the biggest need right now, there was more than 100,000 people that fled north after Aleppo um, was under siege in December. And so World Vision is directly frontline on that. Um, hospital supplies, clean water, uh, just safe spaces for kids to be kids. Um, it's not easy in a war zone, and, and that's what they're doing. So the proposed ceasefire mm -hmm. that's been talked about, is it real? Is it, is it going to improve things? I mean, we don't know. It's been in place since December, uh, but the two ceasefires before have collapsed. And, and groups like ISIS, our armed groups, are not a part of it. So it's very, very fragile, Lorna. And there's fear that if that ceasefire collapse, collapses is that, um, you know, people are airstrikes will target those same people that have been on the run. So um, World Vision is there right now, heaters, blankets, whatever is needed Bravo. for those people right now. Yeah. All right. Well, here in Canada, our government is praised internationally for welcoming in 25,000 Syrian refugees in a record three months. But what has happened since then? Sheldon Neal now with the numbers. All right. Everyone knows about the first 25,000. But did you know Canada settled another 15,000 Syrians since then? Let's take a look at this as it comes on the screen. 40 1,081 new Syrian neighbors to be exact. This may seem like a large number, but Canada has done this before. Let's look a little bit deeper. Back in the 50s, during the Hungarian Revolution, Canada brought in 37,000 Hungarians. In the late 60s, when Czechoslovakia was invaded, 11,000 Czechs were ushered in. Now, in 1979, 60,000 Vietnamese boat people made Canada home. Now, we as Canadians historically help in emergencies, and Canada is also investing inside of Syria. Take a look at where your taxpayer dollars are going over there. Let's take a look at this. Uh, for the next three years, the largest amount goes to humanitarian assistance. About 10 million goes towards development assistance. Health, water, and education are also top priorities here. And finally, Canada is pushing for stabilization and security, which is everything from unled peace negotiations to supporting Syrian civil society. Now, by the way, Lorna, Canada is preparing to welcome another 25,000 refugees in 2017, not specifically Syrians, but anyone in need. All right. Well, Linda Tripp is very familiar with all that kind of need with helping Canadian refugees. And Linda, from snatching Vietnamese boat people from the Chinese... South China Sea. South Chinese Sea. Yeah. Uh, that was in 1979. Yeah. Helicopters threatened 
uh, this was dangerous work. Like, this was crazy. World Vision just said, no one has got a boat out there. We better get a boat out there. Yeah, World Vision was the first, uh, first organization, first country to have a mercy ship because these boats were crowded with people. Um, pirates were, were attacking them. Um, commercial ships were violating international law and passing them by. And it looked as scary as what it looks like to us now to say all of that war-torn people shouldn't be coming here. I think we've got a shot of you in the refugee camp. So when they could find land, you were doing inoculation. Yeah. And uh, that's this shot that we've got of you with, with, with the refugees. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask now about the attitude at that time. Were Canadians as concerned as what we're hearing now? Canadians are so generous. We, we are good. <laughs> we have earned that reputation, Lorna. The fact is, refugees are like us. They're just people who want to provide for their families, their children in school. They want to worship in peace. They're just like us. And Canadians recognize that. And when, when I saw the, the private sponsorship program developed back in 1980 for the boat people, when I saw the churches and the groups of just, just ordinary Canadians coming together to sponsor boat people, um, it was tremendous. But maybe what's most important for Canadians to recognize today is, what happened to the children of those boat yeah. people? They're our teachers. They're our, you know, our business people. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They're firefighters. That's what's going to happen with these Syrians. Okay, and you have just used your retirement in a wonderful way because you have helped, uh, excuse me, lead sponsorship at your local church. Right. And it's been rewarding, right? Well. <laughs> Very short, because I want I to talk about the context sponsorships. Yeah. Well, St. George's Anglican Church in Guelph, we've sponsored a Syrian family. They have triplets. They're, it's unusual. They're a Christian family, not Muslim. But they had two-year-old triplets when they arrived. And Lorna, I can't tell you the joy on their faces and ours when we met last April. OK. Well, let's take a look now at some pictures from our files here, because we've been talking here a lot about the Syrian war for the last three years, asking people to sponsor. And we're, these are two families, the, the Saloum family. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two little cousins <laughs> who um, our viewers saw the need that was coming over Context Television. And some people at home said, we can pay for it. And there were some churches who said, but we don't have the money, but we've got the labor. And so we put two churches together and it's beautiful to see these two families have wonderfully come together, two brothers and their families and uh, beautiful. Okay, we are gonna um, touch base with that more. Linda, thanks so much for being with My us. My pleasure, Lorna. Just last week in Antakya, there was a church helping people get food, but the government actually stopped them tell them they have to stop feeding people. After the break, serving refugees in a country hostile to Christians. Stay with us. Next week on Context, Canada's court system is in disarray. We explore how waiting lists and delays are so long, people accused of deadly crimes are being set free before a trial is even held. Connect with us in advance on Facebook. Today, only 10% of Syrians, around uh, 300,000 Syrians, only stay in camps uh, on, the, on the borders. Uh, the other ones, nearly um, two, more than 2 million Syrians, now live around Turkey and they have their apartments, they rent the apartments, they, they have their businesses. And um, also, uh, they work as NGO workers uh, in the NGOs which help Syrian refugees. That was reporter A.J. Gostrevek from Al Jazeera, Turkey. She's worked the Syrian-Turkish border for the past five years, and to see her full interview on the changing dynamics in Turkey, go to our website. These are the official number of registered refugees in the region. Keep in mind, the unofficial count is much higher. Turkey, for example, has been said to be helping more than four million people. Well, Protestant churches are trying to meet the needs of new Syrians around Turkey, but it's not always easy. Hate crimes continue against Christians in Turkey, with churches vandalized and clergy attacked in a country known to crack down on Christians. How do people help? Molly Thomas sits down with a Turkish pastor. What are the specific challenges, I mean, of, of a church in Turkey helping refugee populations? We are not only helping Syrians physically and medically, 
we feel that they need psychological support too. So sometimes we pray with people to address the spiritual needs. But when we did that, we had a little problem with the government who attacked us, calling us missionaries, saying we had alternative plans. If there's that, you know, that pressure from some people in the government, um, but as Christians, you know, uh, Christians all, are all about spreading the good news. How do, you, how do you work and live within that tension? Not all the government has a problem with our way of dealing with the refugees, just a few people. We have been helping people in humanitarian needs since the 90s. So if we keep doing that, maybe one day we'll convince the government that we don't have side plans. Give us an idea of, of how the Turkish Protestant churches are responding to the Syrian crisis in this country. When Syrians left their homes and came to Turkey, they didn't have anything with them. We regularly supplied breakfast to the camps. We also provided tents for some and helped pay rents for others. I want to ask about, about, about working with uh, an incoming Muslim population. I mean, how is that relationship working? The people we serve rarely ask about our spiritual intentions. Before the war in Syria, Muslims and Christians were living in harmony, so they didn't see a problem with us helping them. Why is it important, I mean, for, for you, for, for the churches in Turkey to, to reach out to help people? When Jesus helped people, he didn't wait for payback. He didn't want anything in return. That's how we look at other people, not looking at races and nationalities. We look at others as simply human. It's not about making children leave school, it's about surviving. Up next, why books are on the chopping block in this household. Next week on Context, Canada's court system is in disarray. We explore how waiting lists and delays are so long, people accused of deadly crimes are being set free before a trial is even held. Connect with us in advance on Facebook. Look at these ruins the ruins of this war. This is what the refugees from Syria that are now denied entry, this is why these refugees, this is what these refugees have fled from. Well, of course, it is the people who lose in such deadly political conflicts as the one of uh, the greatest setback for the uh, Syrian people is education, Molly, isn't it? That's the big setback, is education. <laughs> it's been massive. I mean, uh, we started this story two years ago when we traveled to Jordan, and of course at that time, uh, we at Context, we focused in on lost scholars. Yeah, it was you 2015 know, we went down. 2015. You, you went for us, yes. Yeah, university students that were caught in limbo because they were out of the classroom. But you know, the problem really trickles down to anyone that goes to school, because if there's no opportunities for you long term, um, why would you go to class? Yeah, and so what's being done? Is it getting better? Is it, I, I remember how heartbroken you were that you were, you were <laughs> actually finishing your master's degree then and thinking, you get to go to school. Is it better? Um, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I think uh, you could say it is. In some ways, in terms of internationally, there's uh, some Skype opportunities for teachers that are reaching out. There are some sponsorship opportunities that are happening, but that's more of a, on a micro level. On a macro level, um, there are so many problems both happening outside and inside of the war zone. Take a look. In a small Turkish bazaar, it's easy to spot the Syrian. In the old city, I always have two shops. In the old souk. In the old souk, yes. In the old souk. Like souk. People know that from around the world because <laughs> it was a very it's famous the mini place. street. It's maybe in my shop here, about 50, 50 kinds of pieces. But in my shop in Syria, more than 250. Obada Shama left it all behind three years back. Today, he barely breaks even putting his dreams on hold for that of his children. Uh, and my uh, daughter, she's in elementary school. She, but Shama's kids are the lucky ones. In Turkey, only 39% of Syrian children are in the classroom. For sisters, Rakaya and Halima, learning is a luxury. School was a dangerous risk for them back in Syria. Uh, we were hearing screamings. We knew that on the opposite side of the street, they, they are kidnapping and killing a family. So the family fled to Turkey. 
But four years in, their father cannot find a stable job. When it's raining, it's not that good. Yeah, there's like holes in the ceiling and the water can come down. They live in a makeshift shelter on someone else's property. We burn those empty boxes, hid to warm up the house. The girls have an older brother. He's in school, but he doesn't know that he will soon have to drop out. It's not a matter of me wanting to teach my children or not. It's a matter of basic stuff, like bread is more important than education at this point. And it's a sad trend in the region. 900,000 school-age students are out of the classroom. The UN says refugees are five times more likely to miss out on education than their global peers. In Syria, access to education is the biggest hurdle. 2.1 million children are missing class. That's because school attacks are normal, and one in four educational facilities are destroyed, used for shelter, or occupied by armed groups. A lot of kids are scared to even walk out their door um, because of the shellings, because of the airstrikes. Um, how, does, how does that work, I mean, in, 20, in 2017? Uh, so, like, there is no ideal way to do it. So everything is just coming out of the situation. Schools become source of danger. Like, so students were really afraid to go to school. As like an alternative, we cooperated with their parents, we cooperated with local councils, education directorate. And what we did is that we made alternative education, which is home-based education. Let's say like in every alley we'll make two or three. So in people's so homes. That, exactly. You've been in Syria, you've talked to some of these families, these students, these teachers. Do people still believe in education? People right now and students are feeling like we will build our future and we will complete and resume education and we will not um, give up at all. Okay, I think that's very cool that we're in a refugee camp hearing from young adults saying we are not going to give up. Their kids your age and a little younger saying we still need our education. Sheldon, when you see how well our refugees, and that's just this week, we were, uh, Musa was in their home with them this week, how do you feel about that, knowing that viewers at Context were able to donate for refugees, and then churches who are in relationship with Context were able to get these two families going? We've been at it for a year and a half with our refugee families. Well, I think that's really encapsulate what the being the hands of Jesus is all about, stretching out to those who are in need, those who are hurting, and seeing, hey, how can I reach out, not to uh, a, a stranger, but to my fellow brother, my fellow sister, and help healing and restoration really take place? Okay, so that's the help here. What we're doing with refugee work and you're doing it in your homes as well but Molly I love the journalists partnership with the aid work and I love it that um, raw hope is on the ground there already and this this really matters right like we, we tend to be fatigued of this but it's still so critical isn't it yeah I think that you know we, we forget about some of these stories and, and, and as the longer that crises you know, go on, it's easy for us to just go on with our lives, but these children are affected every single day, That's these right. families are affected, and there's a way that we can actually do something. Okay, all right, so the contact number is 1-866-595-5550. On this, the sixth anniversary of the Syrian war, don't forget the suffering people. Uh, Four million, uh, do your best. Thanks for joining Context, thank you. It's great, you guys. It's great.